Just sitting with uh, Rob Crow, dual Australian champion uh, cyclist, uh, won the time trial and the road race in 91, and uh, also an ex-Olympian. Robbie, tell us a bit about your achievements, mate. Tell us. You've got to say former Olympian, uh, Ferg. It's, you're never ex. Once really? you've done it, that's former. it. You're an Olympian. <laughs> <laughs> Ala unopened Athens jacket oh, just so for this interview. Good. Uh-huh. So good. So, um, so you won the time trial and the road race in 91. Am I looking at you or the glance? Uh, well, look at look at me, but look at the gl- glance give, at the Give everyone yeah. a go. Yeah. Um, uh, Athens was a Paralympic event on 4,000 metre pursuit. So back in 92 in Barcelona, yep. there was an unfortunate flat tyre for the team, uh, the four-man 100k time trial. So, you know, 12 years later, another chance, got the call up chance in this for you to get a medal? No, not really. Yes, there is. Break the wood record, won the gold medal for Australia with uh, Kieran Modra from Adelaide in the blind, the blind 4,000 metre tandem pursuit. So that was the most amazing ride ever to do because it's uh, someone else sharing it with you. You've got to do it together in sync. So different ball game altogether. But yeah. So have you done the warning before? I can imagine. I have. I had a great experience coming off a European fitness in 93. Um, I captained the VIS team then with Dave McKenzie. Um, unfortunately, I was the only one left out of the VIS with uh, 10k to go, and I ended up fighting off four or five Jayco, the original Jayco Pro team with Dean Woods at the head of it, and he he ran off in the last four k's. He was a great 4,000 metre rider himself, yeah, and I yeah. botched that and yeah. chased him and missed catching him on the finish line and came second. So I got a second in the Warner Boy in '93. Now my mistake was thinking I could just turn up again 10 years later and try and ride it <laughs> with less training. It takes a lot of training, so. Uh, and I didn't come top 10 ever again, so. Yeah. Right, and so you, that was the, that was when they were doing it as a handicap? Correct, it used to run as a, probably a, just over one hour between the limit riders and the scratch group, and it left from city centre sort of casino in Melbourne. Uh, it was about 270 k's, and it was the. I think that year it was the record fast as a tailwind, very hard to catch the, the front markers. And the scratch guys got the time, so Dean Woods would have won the time. I don't think that he actually won the race. I, I think we possibly didn't catch everyone that year. Yep, so a tailwind, it's harder to catch the limit ride Correct. In, in a handicap. So you want a headwind, it slows everybody down, and of course the fitter riders are more advantaged by that. Yeah, right. So we were disappointed at the time. Yeah. Can't remember the actual spec. And so what it was um, 295 back in those days. Oh no, I think it got a bit longer. They took a different route through the back of Werribee and through parts of Geelong that made it get up around 300. Yeah. But I don't think it was over 280 the year we rode it. No. Yeah. It was very fast. It was like 80 k's an hour going down to Geelong. Tailwind. Yeah. 60, 50 or 60 scratch riders. There's some fantastic photos in the newspapers about this yeah. that you could look back at. I could probably send one to you if you'd like. Yeah. Um, looking down on the overpasses on the freeway at the, yeah. at the scratch bunch coming through in one single gigantic echelon working 70 k's an hour. 70 to 80, k, 80 k's. I looked down a couple of times, 80 k's an hour on some of the gr- nice big rollers are there on the run yeah, into Geelong. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and you had to be very careful that you, because of the work of, an, of a handicap, everyone's working because you want to catch everyone, so you can't afford to botch up your eating and your drinking pattern. So every 15, 20 minutes, it's sipping, nibbling, sipping, nibbling. I had food stuffed up my s- sleeves and my jumper so I didn't have to reach too much yeah. all the time going through, you know, four or five bites of a bar, next bar, under the sleeve, next 50 k's ready to go, sort of thing like that. Yeah. Um, seven times, I reckon, in 93, I wanted to get off. I reckon it was seven times, that, and the team car would come up sometimes and to support during the race. And I'm like, I want to get in. No, you're not getting in. You're not getting in. You're halfway. You're looking good. I'm like, I want to get in. No, nah, keep going. Uh, see you later. And I mean, I have to say thanks to uh, Dave Sanders for that from the VOS, the coach of the VOS, because I seriously would have got off many times before. It was crosswinds. Warnable's famous for bad weather. Yeah. Um, hail and sleet and rain and wind the wrong way, coming from your right cheek all the time. So it pushes the echelons off and into the left gutter and you, you, you know, there's only enough room on the, on the roadway for one group of, say, 15 riders. Yep. And then it's game over for everyone else. So it's a, a war of attrition. So basically, um, this is my next thing I was going to ask you, obviously, the tips. But so... I've been saying to a couple of my mates that are new to the race, make sure, make sure you stay up the front. Well, yeah. So what the, do you think? Well, the game is with good race skills, with that kind of stuff, with uh, 
long distance racing, especially like this, is you want to be uh, near the front but not on the front, which is a skill of its own. Yep. Mixing with the front arrowhead guys, doing a turn to, to earn your spot there. It's a bit of a right yep. thing. Once you, especially if you get in there early in the day, yep. people get to know that you're part of the front end group and you sort of almost have a, yep, you've got a ticket here. Yep. So you don't do no work, but you try not to do too much. And that's a difficult little game because yeah. you want to keep the motor running all the time, be part of the front end, yep. but not cook yourself because it's a long day. So yeah, yeah. again, drinking and eating all the time as a little habit is good. Um, riding lower gear ratios, so revving more than pushing hard on the gears is very important. Yep. You want to basically rev for as long as you can into the day and let the big load on the gears for your muscles come late, yep. which means you've got to be, I mean, it's a bit late now to go and train your speed up, yep. but the guys who will do very well, even some of the local guys that haven't been racing international or racing the whole winter season, if they've done a lot of motor pacing with high rev training, they'll be very good. It's a yep. fairly flat course all the way. Yep. So if you're good on the high revs, over yep. 100 revs all the time, and saving the muscles, saving the muscles, you know, five hours later, a lot of the guys that haven't got that will be game over, and that's when the race really starts. So we used to look at it as um, as the race starting, you know, inside the last 20 k's. So camper down 60 k to go, it hasn't even started yet. It's, it's about staying in touch with a good slipstream, looking after yourself, again, keeping the fuel going in, because it's all about the last 20 k's. What sort of fuel would you be talking about? Like what? What's the best thing to sort of eat? And well, eat and... I mean, you know, guys will have a lot of fancy stuff these days. There's a lot of nice um, carbo mixes with the glycogen and the gels and all that. But I used to stick with something other than the sports food, which you don't want to have too much of that. Because even if you just get sick of eating, it's difficult to get it down. Yeah. Um, I used to have wet, uh, the moister type fruit cakes. Yeah. As I said, with you know, wrapped, easy to undo in a bit of foil, but not too much foil. Yeah. You can just flick one part of the foil over and I'd have them stuffed up the sleeve every now and then and just be chewing through that. Um, I never wanted to have more than one of the two biddens on the bike with a mix, so yep. pure water always in one of the two. Yep. Um, and, and, and because it's so long, the, the, the day's long, um, you're dehydrating all the time. Yep. Uh, even the mixed drinks are low concentration. Yep. You want ma massive amount of water going and, through. And if you what can, get can happen is you basically get sick. People get sick if they take too much electrolyte on board. Yeah. Well, you, the, the worst, the worst version of what's going on there is you're dehydrating from the inside out. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the concentrated stuffs going in through gels, food, and mixtures of drink. Yep. And your body's trying to process that. And if you haven't got enough water in the mixture that's going in your stomach you know where the water's going to come from to process and digest that, it's coming from the cells in the body. Yeah, so yeah. it dehydrates your system from the inside, yeah, that's yeah. what you don't want. Yeah. That's intracellular dehydration, that'll stop you thinking straight and give you cramps, run your motor down and no power. See yeah, you later. Right. Mm. See you later, straight up. Hydration's yeah. key mate, yeah. big time. Okay. Alright, and is there, uh, is there anything else you'd recommend to the newbies? Just well, I've got a super duper top tip, but I only give it usually to my paying customers, right? Yeah. So we'll slip that in if it's, you got a sec? Yeah, the finish straight, Raglan Parade is famous for being a big excitement topper because you come around the bend um, into that last kilometre, you go up a little hill coming into 1K to go and you go around the bend, you can see the home straight, you can see the banners on the right side. Um, you have to understand that Warrnambool Main Street Raglan Parade is a double causeway with a nature strip and all the crowd and the commentary and the spectators and the banners are on the central strip. So you're really only looking at one side of the highway. Now the reason that you're seeing it, if you take all the banners away and the people and the finish line and the, the, the noise and everything, you see it for what it really is, which is a sloping to the left off the crown of the nature strip. It's actually sloping to the left. Now the trick with this is that People do two things, they go too early in the sprint, they, 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 people start to attack, riders start to go from that bend. It's actually 1.1 kilometres to go and they see the finish line, it's, they've been out there remember six plus hours, it's like there it is and they go, it's way too early to go. You've got to wait and you've got to wait and you've got to wait, in fact you've got to wait so long you're almost at the finish, it looks like you're at the finish when you really should sprint. You riding it this year? Because this is a big good tip for you. Yeah I am. So you, there's actually a great western hotel on the left. There's a bit of a dip in the road and then it goes gradually up to the finish line. Yeah. At the Great West and that's 300 metres. That's when you should go. Okay. And if you did sprint well, you'd drift down to the left because you're getting a downhill run when everyone else is going up. And you'll be surprised to know, and pleased to know, a lot of riders will sprint up against the barriers for the protection of the barrier against the wind and for the control of having knowing that riders can only come on their left. Yeah. They're actually sprinting uphill while you drift downhill to the left. 
second place and 93 good tip. Go for it. I love it. Have a good day. <laughs> Last thing, mate. Um, your uh, your cycle centre, you've just moved into Melbourne Road. Um, oh, Glen Ferry Road, Glen, Melbourne. Sorry, Glen Ferry uh, Road. Corner of High Street and Glen Ferry, just near there. Yep. yep. That's so sort of the central there? hub of all the big cycling interest in Melbourne, you know. Yeah, so we put ourselves definitely. right in the middle. I yeah. live around the corner, so I know you're spot on there. <laughs> but um, So you're running ergo sessions? Yes, and morning and night training the engines. Anyone who wants to build their engine, that's how you do it. Coaching? Well, it is really. You're learning with a group of people and an instructor and placement screen de um, design training exercises and using a special bike with a fixed wheel wind fan drive. So it's making the muscles work properly through the whole circular pedal stroke and properly warming up, very well structured sessions so they bring the motors right up into the top level outputs and then do the hard work in the last 15 minutes. Right. They get up to an hour and a half per session training done. Yeah. Very high quality, rich with um, training structure and learning all the time while okay. you're there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Awesome man, thanks, thanks for Luke. Good, Cheers, on mate. Good on you guys. So just interviewed Robbie Crow, Hanny was there as well, mate, awesome interview, absolutely loved it. What did you think Han? It was awesome. You love Crowey? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Robbie Crowe's Hannah's new uh, new personal favourite. But um, yeah, good interview. So uh, good luck, guys. We'll um, good luck for the Melbourne Warnable. We will. Uh, I'll show you a couple of things that uh, you should um, should and shouldn't do for the race, and uh, just with feeds and stuff, and um, just a couple of my personal tips. And uh, good luck from there. Is that over an hour? Yeah.